Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. Today, Bob will discuss data governance roles and responsibilities, sponsored today by data.world. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag RWDG. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you may click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Tim for a brief word from our sponsor, data.world. Tim, hello and welcome. Hello, hello, Shannon. Thank you so much. Love the opportunity to work with the folks over at Dataversity. It's always so much fun. And Bob is awesome. He is such a great speaker and an expert around governance. So this is going to be such a great webinar for folks to, to consume some great content here. So thanks for having us and the opportunity to sponsor. Um, a quick introduction about Data.World and to kind of kick off our webinar today. I uh, just wanted to say I'm Tim Gasper, VP of Product over at Data.World, also the co-host of Catalog and Cocktails. If you enjoy uh, you know, these kinds of webinars and, and love learning about data, uh, Catalog and Cocktails is on all your favorite social platforms, and as well as broadcasted live on places like Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, it's an honest, no BS, non-salesy conversation about enterprise data, and we drink cocktails while we talk about data. So it's a ton of fun. Check it out. And Today, just really quickly as we kick things off, uh, I wanted to introduce who Data.World is and talk a little bit about why this idea of agile governance, non-invasive governance is so important that Bob pushes on and really advocates around. First of all, Data.World is different. We are the enterprise data catalog for the modern data stack, but we are relentlessly focused on adoption. We believe that there's such a big issue and challenge around data enablement, around data literacy, and governance and cataloging are key areas where you can really make a difference in that area. Data.World was born on the cloud. It is focused on how can we really easily integrate with your environment and create that discovery. We believe in a Facebook and Amazon-like experience, consumer-grade experiences around collaboration, and really around being open and flexible, no black boxes, interoperability with the rest of your stack. And something that's really important in the governance world right now that folks like Bob are doing such an amazing job really bringing to light is around the changing uh, sort of winds in the world of governance. And governance is now becoming much more about data discoverability than just data protection. While application silos continue to pose governance challenges, taking an inclusive and agile approach can make a huge, huge difference. Governance needs to be a benefit, not a burden. And I know many of you in your organizations are focused on turning governance, not just into a defensive uh, sort of activity, but actually going on offense and helping the company create more value from data and actually taking friction away. And finally, business users don't want to have to install a bunch of software. And that's where we see that cloud and software as a service is making a big difference in the world of governance. There's a huge movement towards not barriers, but accelerators, right? And so uh, at Data.World, one of the concepts that we're so excited about is this idea around agile data governance, where you can take, as Bob really advocates, a non-invasive approach to governance, take an iterative approach to governance, really focus on the collaboration of people across your company, and focus on use cases, because ultimately you don't want to boil the ocean. You don't want to just take a platform approach. You want to solve problems. You want to help various parts of the business to find the data that they need and put it to work. And if you can take a faster approach, then what you can do is you can take your data producers and your data consumers, take out some of the middlemen or the more complicated processes and really focus on this flywheel, right? You need to be able to curate, audit, govern, and document, and you need to do it as fast as possible. Iterate your way towards more value and better governance within the organization. There's a lot of different people involved in governance, right? From the program team and the actual governance team that are working on it, to data engineers, to the data stewards, whether you've uh, got full-time stewards or more like most companies, you've got folks that are just wearing that hat, right? data analysts and decision makers that are all part of that cycle. And they all have an important role to play in governance and making it more iterative and more agile. 
And importantly is think about how you can build your data front office. If you're trying to empower use of data, if you're trying to make data governance work better in your organization, think about how you can create a layer where folks can find what they need, where it interoperates with the rest of your data ops ecosystem. So if you're using other lineage or quality or policy type tools that those things can work together, Ultimately, you want to understand your data supply chain and provide a more self-service experience around AI and machine learning and analytics for the rest of the organization. So agile data governance is the way to go. And Bob is an excellent expert to talk about all the things that you should be doing around governance and key roles and responsibilities today. So I'll pass the baton back over to you, Shannon, to get things kicked off. And thank you so much. Always a joy to have you uh, presenting with us and data.world sponsoring. If you have questions for Tim, he's going to be joining us in the Q&A at the end here. So if you have questions for him about data.world or data governance, feel free to submit them in the Q&A panel. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, Bob Siner. Bob is the president and principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the data administration newsletter, tdan.com. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I'll give the floor to Bob for his presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Thank you, Tim, for that great presentation. I, I really liked a lot of the things that you spoke about. My slides seem to be changing on their own today. So let's try not to let that happen. Um, thanks again, Tim. That was a great presentation. I really like the, the concept of agile data governance, the iterative approach. I just had conversations with clients this morning. We're not going to be able to um, to flip a switch and have governance come on for the entire organization. So why don't we learn from what we're doing and do it in an iterative, more of an agile type fashion. You also alluded, Tim, to the people that need to be involved. And that's specifically what I want to talk about today is the specific roles and responsibilities that are necessary to stand up a formal data governance. I know that, uh, Tim, you talked about stewards and engineers and a bunch of other roles, the people that run the program and those types of things. I wanna provide to you a model today that, that you can perhaps use within your organization that details each of the different roles and responsibilities. And would love to hear questions uh, on the subject as to you know, whether or not these are things that are working in your organization, or if you have questions about how to get some of those things working. So now I'm going to change my slides. Okay, things are moving weird here. Okay, so before I get started real quickly, just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I've been doing this webinar series, <clears throat> excuse me, for many years, always on the third Thursday of the month. That is today. Next month, we'll be talking about the role of metadata in the data governance program. I'll also be speaking at Dataversity's DGIQ um, event that's gonna be taking place in June in San Diego. I talk a lot about non-invasive data governance. I know Tim referred to it and um, it always seems to come up in conversation as to how you can be non-invasive in the way that you're implementing your governance program. Um, so there's a book about it if you want to learn more about it. In fact, the book has now been translated into Dutch, Italian, German, and French. So if you're uh, interested in receiving a book for, of that, uh, in that translation, please look for it. I also provide some non-invasive data governance classes and metadata governance classes through the Dataversity Training Center. I published the TDAN or the Data Administration Newsletter publication and I've been doing that for 25 years. Um, also have the KIK Consulting and Educational Services is, is my consulting and education business. And on the side, as if all those things weren't enough to keep somebody busy, I'm also an adjunct faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is where I am from. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk specifically about the backbone of a successful data governance program. We're gonna talk about roles and responsibilities that go into communications, they go into task plans, Planning. They go into accountability and ownership for the data. Roles and responsibilities play a critical part in uh, a are a critical component of a successful data governance program. So I'm going to talk about five different levels of data governance roles. I'm going to share with you an operating model that I've used a lot in the webinars and that I use a lot with clients and talk about how you can basically take that operating model and customize it to meet the requirements from your organization. So instead of plugging into my model, I always suggest take my model 
and be less invasive about it. Take the model and overlay it over your organization. We'll talk about setting appropriate expectations for each of the roles. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about how to operationalize the roles and demonstrate value to the organization. So real quickly to get started, I just wanna share with you some definitions. And then I actually wanna share with you my data governance framework and talk to you about how that relates to the operating model of roles and responsibilities that I'm gonna share with you. So just real quickly, my definitions of data governance uh, and data stewardship are as follows. I say that data governance is the execution and enforcement of authority, even though I say that we are gonna do it in a non-invasive manner. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to follow the rules that we're setting up. We need to formalize accountability for what people are doing with data as they define, produce, and use data. So that kind of leads into my data stewardship or, um, definition. And then a data steward, and we'll talk more about who the data stewards are and where they fit into this model as I go throughout the webinar today. But it is a person that has a relationship to the data that's actually being held formally accountable for what they do with the data, whether that's defining data, producing data, or using data. I have been known to say that everybody is a data steward and that organizations should get over it. You know what? If people have relationships to the data and they're being held accountable for those relationships, basically they're a steward. It's not something that somebody can opt into or opt out of. So it's interesting that I've had several clients recently that have taken my operating model that I'm gonna share with you, the pyramid diagram that you may have seen before about roles and responsibilities, and they refer to it as their framework. So I don't use that term to describe my operating model. And I wanna share with you what, just real quickly, before we jump into the levels of the model, um, how it even came to be and, and the framework that is used basically to build out the model. And the framework basically uh, uh, includes things like the core components of data governance. And one of those core components is the roles and responsibilities associated with your program. It goes through the organizational levels and then it cross-references those. You may have seen this diagram before and it's what I refer to as my data governance framework. And like I said, I have those six core components across the top of the screen. And then down the, the left-hand side, I have the five different levels that basically, at least from my experience, represent all of the people within the organization that we need to engage in data governance. And so what I wanna do is I wanna, first of all, highlight what I had up in the upper left-hand corner of the framework, just to share with you again, the components and the levels that we wanna talk about. But actually when I first delivered this framework, I didn't have a data column. So the data column has been added in the last several years, but I really think we need to look at data in terms of what the executives care about. We need to look at the role of each of those levels in the organization. We need to look at the processes that mean something to each of those different parts of the organization. So as I start to lead into talking about the five different levels of roles and responsibilities, let's focus on the executive, strategic, tactical, operational, and support levels of the organization. So it's nice to have an empty framework and it's nice to fill in the framework. I also wanna to provide to you an example of the framework filled in. And I, I want to specifically focus on the roles column. And you can see at the role in the roles column, there's a level uh, at the, it, it um, intersects the executive level, the strategic and, and so on all the way down. We need to make certain that we know who the people are at the executive level that need to support sponsor and understand data governance in order for us to be successful, in order for us to decrease the risk to the organization. Many organizations have data governance councils at the strategic level, have data owners or domain stewards or subject matter experts at the tactical level, at the operational level, there's everybody in the organization that has a relationship to the data if they're gonna be called a data steward or if they are going to be recognized as stewarding data as part of their job. And then there's the support functions. So I wanted to share this with you before I got into my operating model of roles and responsibilities, because roles is only one component of a successful program while you've got processes, communications, metrics, tools, and those types of things. Um, 
we're going to focus on the roles and responsibilities in those five levels right now. So first of all, what are the levels that, and you know what, I would suggest that if these levels are different for your organization, you make them what you need to make them for your organization. I had a client, a power company on the West Coast and here in the U.S. tell me, you know what, we use different terminology. We actually flip the operational and the tactical level. So they had the operational level up as the cross business function perspective and the tactical as being very business unit function perspective. So the, these are the five levels and typically they represent the majority, if not really everybody in your organization. And so again, make them your own as you're building out your operating model, but these are the standard five that I use. And so what are we gonna call the different people at each of these different levels? And we'll go through this in a little bit more detail when we go through the, the operating model in detail. But at the executive level, oftentimes there's already a group of people, a steering committee. Um, you have a group of executives that meet regularly or meet at least on a scheduled basis. Um, and we don't need to create a new executive level, but we can take advantage of the steering committee or a, an advisory committee at the executive level. Um, at the strategic level, like I said, many organizations have data governance councils, data strategy committees, advisory groups, um, or if you don't have one of those, we'll talk about in detail what that role needs to, what the role is that that group needs to play within the organization. And then there's the tactical level. Those are the subject matter experts. Those are the people that have accountability for data across business units. So not just specifically within their business unit, but people who are looking at the data across the organization. And then at the operational level, we've got those people that are defining, producing, and using data as part of their job. And then there are some support level functions that are required to implement a data governance program. So there's the administration of the program itself. There's also, the, the working teams of, of pulling together people to resolve issues. Um, there's also the different partners that there are within the organization. So, you know, you might want to think about the different roles that are necessary to move your program forward. And I wanted to share with you, at least quickly here, who the people are that typically participate at, at these levels. So for the executive level, it's people at the top of the organization. I think that's pretty well understood if it's C-level or executive board members. It really depends on your organization, but there should be some type of executive levels um, recognition of the program and understanding of the program in order for you to guarantee success moving forward. At the strategic level, there, there's a committee. Um, you know, you want to build a committee that would be the council or the advisory group. At the tactical level, immediately you might want to point to who are the people who really have the answers about the data or know the most about the data as the subject matter experts. Those are the people that are going to participate at your tactical level. The operational level, as I've stated several times here, can be basically anybody in the organization, people that define, produce, and use data as part of your job uh, or part of their job. And at the support level, again, the program leadership, you know, the existing functions and the, the teams that are going to be brought together to resolve issues or to address opportunities in your organization. So what are some of the things that we need to define for people when we are slotting them into a role or recognizing them into a role is how much of their time is going to be required. How often, if they're actually part of a group, how often is that group going to meet? Um, or is it just an individual function rather than a group function? Who are you going to report to uh, data-wise? And, and who's going to coordinate this effort moving forward? So um, when you get to the point where you are going to onboard people to each of these different roles, you're going to need to provide to them detailed responsibilities, including things that are specific to the role, details of their involvement in, in working teams, details of the documentation that might, might be expected from them or that they're going to get engaged with as you're activating your program, and then validating the detailed responsibilities with people that are in the roles. I talk about this model a lot. So this is where I really want to focus a bunch of the presentation today is on the pyramid diagram. So, and again, like I said, I have some clients that actually refer to this as being their data governance framework. 
I actually consider the idea that a, a framework is going to include more than the roles and responsibilities. So I draw this model this way for a purpose. Um, the first response that people have typically when they see, they see this model is they think that it's very overwhelming. They think that it's very bureaucratic. Boy, do we have to plug into that? And in fact, like I mentioned before, the idea is to take the model, take the roles and responsibilities that we're gonna define here and overlay them over what already exists within your organization. So you'll find that there are some ways that you can build this model that decrease some of the fear factor of, wow, do we need all of these different roles and responsibilities when we're delivering the program? So I wanted to blow it up for you because people always tell me that often, well, at least oftentimes tell me that the diagrams are not big enough for you to read. So hopefully this is big enough for you to read. Um, recognize that there are people at the executive level that participate as the steering committee. There's people that are gonna look at data as, a, as an enterprise asset and that are gonna make up a strategic level or your data governance council. And we're gonna go through in detail what each of these roles do. There's the domain stewards, there's the people that coordinate the activities of the data stewards. I consider those roles to be included at the tactical level. There's the, the data stewards at the bottom. I wanna to explain to you why it's drawn this way too. And I'll, I'll do that in a second. And then down on the left-hand side, there's all the support levels. There's the administration of the program itself. There's people who are governing whose functions are already governing like IT and project management and legal and audit and all of those groups, they're partners of data governance because they're doing governance work. It may not be data governance work, but they're all project management. Your PMs are, are governing your projects. People in IT are governing the information technology assets of the organization and so on. So again, this is the, the model. I wanna dissect it for you. I wanna go through each of the levels and share with you examples of what typical role, the responsibilities would be at each of those roles. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can customize this model to match your organization. And the first thing I wanna point out is that the amount of space in each of those rows lead from the bottom to the top of the, uh, of the pyramid diagram, they represent something. In most organizations, they wanna push as much of the decision-making as they can down to the individual business units of the organization. So if you think of that orange area within the operating model is larger than the tactical, the yellow area, which is larger than the pink area at the top, um, there's a decreasing number of issues that are going to be resolved at each of those levels. So therefore, it makes sense to kind of build it as being a pyramid. You may ask the question, why is there then a tower that's sticking out at the top of the pyramid diagram? Because again, that represents the executive level. But the fact is, if you look at the right-hand side of the pyramid diagram, there's an escalation arrow where we take issues that go from an operational or just individual business unit focus to cross business unit focus to enterprise focus. We don't typically escalate data issues up to the executive level of the organization. That's why you're gonna build some strength in your data governance office. And it's again, you, you, know, you typically aren't going to take data issues all the way up to your executive level of the organization. So the space in each of the levels means something. Um, there's oftentimes consistency in color as well, because I share other models in different webinars and presentations that I've given for data diversity, um, where the models are consistent across the cross model in the use of colors. So if you remember back, and I'm not gonna go back and show you the framework diagram again, but the operational level was consistent with this color, the tactical, the strategic, the executive, and even the supporting groups. So again, you wanna customize the model to represent your organization and, and perhaps the percentage of the decisions that are being made at each of those areas. areas. Um, also the lines, actually the way this model is constructed, the sections kind of just resting up against another section actually means something. Because oftentimes if you look at the model, we see the data governance team, they're touching every part of, the part of this model. They're gonna be engaged with everybody. 
Typically the data governance partners are gonna be engaged with the data governance team. The working teams are gonna be made up of the tactical and operational groups. So again, there's more meaning to the model. I didn't actually intend that initially, but somebody pointed it out to me and said, you know what, if we could really describe in detail how these groups work together, that would be a very powerful thing. And so the last thing I wanna share with you just about how the model is designed itself, is that these groups are not all new to the organization. Some of these things, some of these functions already exist. IT and project management and IT security and privacy, they're already governing. Those partners, you might want to leverage those. You might already have somebody who's responsible for your data governance program. So the data governance office or the administrator, they exist. You may have a steering committee that you can leverage and the council might be new. You can highlight in your model those things that already exist within your organization. And again, this really highlights the non-invasive aspect of governance is that if we can take people from the roles that they're playing and plug them into the model for data governance without really adding a lot to what they do, it's gonna be less threatening to them. It's gonna be the path of least resistance and greatest success for your governance program. Um, and again, you know, it, the use language, call these things the things that make sense to your organization. Um, so let's go through each of these different, uh, uh, differing levels of the five levels that I shared with you. And let's start with the steering committee. So what does the steering committee do? Well, to be honest with you, when it comes to data governance, the steering committee doesn't do a whole lot day to day. They're, I mean, they don't do really much anything at all day to day. They're active. They understand data governance. They're there to support and sponsor data governance. They're people at the highest level of the organization, but they don't have any specific responsibility to data governance except to be reported to. What are the, what's the status? What's the progress of the program? Their real job is to get to the point where they can support, sponsor, and most importantly, understand data governance. Uh, understand what data governance is, what it means to your organization, what it's going to take to be successful, including resources and those types of things. Um, the data governance council, you know, and the things that are happening within data governance, typically they appear as a line item on a steering committee meeting. Uh, on, on a steering committee meetings agenda. So we'll get a few minutes to talk about data governance, but honestly, the people at the data governance steering committee level, they have an understanding, their understanding of data governance only goes so deep. They're looking at so many things across such a broad um, part of the organization that their knowledge and their involvement in data governance doesn't need to be active day to day, but they need to support, sponsor, and understand what you're doing with data governance. So that's a pretty easy one to describe. You probably already have a steering committee, get your data governance program as a line item on that steering committee meeting and you've satisfied the top part of the, the, uh, the operating model. The data governance council is the next level down. And, and oftentimes the steering committee people will have the responsibility of defining who's going to be on the data governance council. Who's gonna be that strategic group where when we escalate issues, it goes to them and it stops there because that's where the decision is being made. So it is important, especially if people at your tactical level don't have the authority to be able to make decisions, it's important to have a group to be able to escalate issues to so people don't just agree to, to, to knock heads together, disagree and go in their own merry way. Now we need to resolve issues. So we need to have a council. And what is the responsibility of the council? Well, it's to become educated in what data governance means. And I'm just gonna read for you here, how it can and how it can work for the organization, how it will work for the organization. They need to approve things that are brought to them because this group is gonna meet fairly regularly. They're gonna meet monthly or quarterly or bi-monthly, however you wanna structure it for your organization. But they're gonna be active in the fact that we're gonna ask them to review and approve data policy, maybe our data governance role framework or operating model or our methods or those types of things. Um, we're gonna ask these folks to help us to push data governance into their areas by doing things that will actively promote data governance activities within their part of the organization. 
one of the really important responsibilities of a data governance council is to make decisions at the strategic level in a timely manner. So oftentimes, since the data governance council meets once a month or meets, you know, once a quarter, we can't, and let's say it's on the second Wednesday of the month, but what if an issue comes up on the second Thursday of the month, we're not going to wait three months for the next group to uh, next meeting to try to pull people together and make a decision. So we need to have a way to be able to work with the council virtually, not necessarily always in the meetings themselves. So the people on the council should attend or they should send alternates. They should stay aware of the things that are happening in the data governance program. They're not running the program, but they are there. They're, they're that strategic body that's helping to um, helping data governance to do the things that are expected from them. They approve, they identify and approve the roles and responsibilities. Um, oftentimes there may be a council owner or somebody whose administrative person perhaps would be responsible for scheduling meetings. But the data governance council is extremely important because otherwise, unless you can push all of your decision making down to the tactical level, you're going to need somebody to break ties, to make decisions, to review things before you take it to people at the executive level. So let's talk about the data domain stewards here for a couple of minutes. And this is a very critical role. In fact, when your organization talks about breaking down silos of data, you need people, <coughs> excuse me, you need people in the organization to view data across business areas. We've got people that are viewing the data pertaining to their specific business area, but you need people, and I refer to them as data domains or data subject matters across organizations. I've, I had always referred to them as data domain stewards until a client of mine said, well, so wait, you call them data domain stewards, but they're really data subject matter experts, right? And I said, yeah, I guess you could consider that to be the case. And they said, okay, that's what we're gonna call them. Again, I'm not stuck to any of these names of what I'm calling the roles, but they, they refer to them as the data subject matter experts. And this is some of their responsibility. So they're responsible for an enterprise management of a domain or a subject area of data across business units. Oftentimes they're identified by a position or maybe a, a, we always go to Mary when we have a question about this specific data, maybe she would be the subject matter expert until we find that she's not the appropriate person and it might be somebody else. When they're acting in the role of the domain steward, whatever affiliation they have to their existing business unit basically becomes secondary. They're really playing the role of looking at that data across the organization rather than specifically within a business unit. They are oftentimes an involved facilitator in bringing people together, the, you know, the, the definition, the production, and the usage of that specific subject area of data across the organization. Sometimes the people as the data domain stewards are the in a position of authority to be able to make decisions. If they're not in a role of authority, you're going to need your counsel because you're going to need to be able to escalate it to somebody who will ultimately make the decision. Some additional responsibilities for the data domain stewards, they're responsible for escalating issues to the strategic level. They're responsible for documenting, uh, if not themselves, they may delegate it to other people, but document how their specific data is classified, document the compliance rules, the business rules for their domain. They're making certain that these rules are not only documented, but they're being communicated to people across the organization. If the person at that tactical level uh, doesn't have the time to do that, it's important that they would be able to delegate these responsibilities. Because again, we're not looking at data in a siloed fashion. We're looking at data to help us to improve our analytical capabilities across the organization. So we don't want people to have five versions of what a, uh, of what a faculty member is, as an example. So you've got the data. So what are some of the traits of the, the data domain stewards? Or, and to be honest with you, the data domain steward is the most difficult role out of this operating model to fill. Or it may be the easiest. You know, if you have a person that you already go to, then maybe it's the easiest. But to determine who the people are that have responsibility for data across business areas is not an easy task. 
So what are some of the traits that make up a good person to be a data domain steward? They have a vision of what the future of data as an asset for your organization, what that looks like. They're looking for ways to improve the status quo. They have the ability to motivate the organization. Again, I don't want to read all of these, these uh, traits, but I really find that people that are successful in the role of a data domain steward do have these traits. The most important bullet might be this bottom bullet, that they have the personal interest, the intuitive ability, communication skills to facilitate, you know, when you get together to resolve issues to a win-win, because there will be differences of opinion when it comes to data and even how that data is defined, how it's produced, how it can be used across the organization. So the data domain steward, that central piece, that yellow piece of the pyramid is the most critical, probably the most critical role. I could probably say each of the roles are very critical. I said the council role was very critical, but the, the people who start to look at data instead of business unit by business unit, but look at it across business unit are extremely important. Okay, let's talk about the data stewards. Of course, they're important too. And as I've been known to say, everybody in the organization that defines and or produces and or uses data as part of their job, and that could be pretty much anybody or everybody in the organization, if they're being held accountable for how they define, produce, and use data, they're data stewards. So there is the potential, you should at least consider the fact that there's not just the five data stewards that we've recognized as part of our program. In fact, we need to have entire coverage of the organization. So we should at least consider the fact that everybody in the organization is a data steward. Um, and so that means they participate in, in creating, reviewing data definitions. Uh, they, they participate in all of these ways. They produce, they create, they update, they delete, they retire data. You could just say they do their job. Basically, data stewards are people that do their job and who have an impact on the data in the organization. They're the people that identify and document issues. They share knowledge with other stewards. They communicate their requirements to people that need to know how the data needs to be set up. They, need, they communicate their concerns, their issues, and their problems. Data stewards are your eyes and ears of data across the organization. You're going to have more data stewards than you're going to have anything else as far as a role and responsibility. Do you need to name, do you need to title them data steward? No. Do they need to understand or recognize that as part of their responsibility? They're stewarding data. They're taking care of data for the organization. Yes. We don't have to call them data stewards, but if you're a person that uses sensitive information and you're being held accountable for how you're protecting that data, you're a steward. You can't say, no, I'm not. It's part of what you do. So they are defining the data that's going to be used by the organization. They're producing the data. They're using the data. They're responsible for the integrity of the usage. Like I said, the data stewards are that bottom section of the pyramid diagram. So we've worked through from the executive level, which is hopefully an existing group, to a council that may already exist or you might need to create new, the subject matter experts or the domain stewards, and then the stewards. Everybody within that triangle part of the diagram, those are business people. Those are, you know, so all of your stewards, now you might have technical data stewards, people in IT that have responsibility for data that is specifically associated with IT. They could be stewards too, but they're not going to be stewards of the same data. They're not necessarily going to be stewards of the business data. IT, I know this is going to be earth shattering to you, but IT doesn't own the data. I know a lot of your business folks think that IT owns the data. No, the business does. We need to engage them appropriately. Okay, let's quickly go down the, the left-hand side of the, uh, of the diagram. Um, I think this one's pretty easy to go through. Um, you need to have somebody that has the responsibility for running your program. So whether that's a data governance manager, data governance lead, administrator, manager, whatever you want to call that person, Somebody needs to have the responsibility for running the program. Some organizations build out data governance offices if they have multiple resources that are working together. Some organizations are planning to build out data governance offices, but we need to at least acknowledge the fact that there is somebody that is responsible for administering the program. That would be your data. I like the name data governance administrator because it does represent what that person does. So oftentimes, 
a group, and I can name several clients right now that have planning teams, data governance planning teams of people that are pulled together to define the team. They eventually may evolve into what becomes a program team. They're still kind of advising on how the program is being built, um, but they're not necessarily the administrators of the program. So the administrator needs to participate in all of the program development activities. They need to architect what your solution looks like, that framework that I shared with you earlier, uh, even the operating model that's still on the screen, they're the ones that are gonna be defining these things and have the responsibility for sharing these things out to the organization. So they really admit, assist in administering the program or they are the administrators of the program. And oftentimes I mentioned the Data Governance Council and that they meet, they can meet fairly regularly, monthly, quarterly, or somewhere in between typically. Um, oftentimes those meetings are facilitated by your data governance administrator or your lead or your manager. Um, they participate in, the, in all of these things as well. And again, don't wanna read them all to you. I hope that this slide deck will be a good resource for you to go back to, um, to understand what are some of the things that a data governance administrator would do. They report to the council, they assist in defining the, the quality metrics. They may be the person that drives the data catalog effort, the metadata management effort within your organization. Um, I will share with you that as, the, as a best practice, I'd say the, the very first best practice that I have is that senior leadership, however that's defined, they support, sponsor, and understand data governance because without that, you're gonna be at risk. The second best practice often focuses on this data governance administration role. We need somebody to run the program. If there's not gonna be, the program's not gonna run itself. So it is a best practice that you would have somebody in your organization that has the responsibility for all these things when it comes to running your program. Because like I said before, the program is not gonna run itself. And so now let's work our way down the left-hand side. So you know you need somebody who's the chief of data governance. You need to take advantage of your data governance partners. And again, the examples that I provide of, of groups that are already governing, but not necessarily governing data, could be your security group, your HR group is governing your employees, your legal audit, communications, project management. There's a lot of different functions within your organization that are already governing something and that have a vested interest in making certain that data governance is successful. Work with them as your partners. Define them as your partners. Don't give them a new role. They've already got a role. You're not trying to do what they do. And hopefully for your sake, they're not trying to do what you do, but you're all governing. So I actually had a group recently that instead of calling it a data governance planning team, they called it a governance planning team. And they had individuals from each of the partners that were part of that governance planning team. So just to give you some additional examples of what the partners do. Um, again, don't want to read through these, but you know, you've got IT, you've got data modelers. These folks are, are focusing on the data. They're there to help you. If you can build working relationships with them, the partners become an integral part of a successful data governance. Oftentimes there's battles as to what, what is the boundaries of one group versus another group. Well, that needs to be clearly defined as part of your roles and responsibilities. What do your data governance partners do versus what does your data governance team or your data governance office do? Provide technical support, provide te uh, technical support for data governance and data cleansing. Again, you can define what it is that your partner's doing. Just include them in your operating model of roles and responsibilities because they're already governing. They should be able to be a big advocate of a successful data governance program. So the last thing that I want to talk to you in the, in the few minutes that I have remaining is to kind of emphasize, I very rarely, if ever, show a picture of the cover of my book this late into the webinar. Um, but I just want to highlight kind of the, the subtitle, which is that if you're taking a non-invasive approach where you're identifying, or should I say recognizing people into roles rather than assigning them into roles, that is really the path of least resistance and greatest success. I know that in, in all the organizations that I work with, people are busy, people have day jobs. Um, if you are going to assign them to be a data steward, it is immediately going to feel like it's over and above what they're presently doing. 
when in fact you may not intend that with what you're with what the way that you're going about associating them with a role. So instead of assigning people, let's recognize them for what they do. So again, emphasize that you're being non-invasive in your approach. You've already got people that are doing some of these things at least. Let's formalize who they are. Let's work with them. Let's onboard them, help them to understand the role that they play. Let's ask them if the role that we've defined associated with data governance matches what they do. And if it doesn't, you know, maybe there's things that we can learn from what they do that we build into our operating model. So highlight the roles that resemble being something new in the organization. If you've got a council, you've got to call that out. Introduce the operating model to people generally in the organization during your onboarding while you're bringing them in to their specific role within the program. And really most importantly is get people in the organization to recognize themselves into roles rather than having to be identified or being assigned into roles. If somebody comes to you and says, I use sensitive information, you know, we need to protect this information, they're a steward. Work with them and, and understand that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in the session, instead of, I know my model, my pyramid diagram is kind of busy and it can be very overwhelming at first glance. But instead of trying to plug into what I have in the model, consider taking the model and overlaying it over your existing organization. Start to recognize people into roles rather than assigning people into roles. So at the executive level, expand the responsibilities of an existing committee. At the strategic level, make certain that you have people who represent each of your business functions. The tactical level, recognize people that we already go to who may be the subject matter experts or the owners of the data. I won't even talk about the operational level because potentially it could be everybody in your organization. And then on the support level, understand and recognize that there's already groups that are governing within your organization. So you want to activate these roles. Oftentimes organizations do that through opportunity focused working groups. I used to refer to them as issue focused or issue resolution groups. They're not only gonna to get together to solve problems, they're gonna to get together to address better ways of doing things. So there may be an opportunity without it being an issue. Um, oftentimes um, we look to get our program operationalized or activated through the use of the data catalog getting people associated with data def definition. Where? In the data catalog. The stuff that Tim talked about earlier, you know, use that as your resource for where you're gonna collect your information about data definition, about data production, and about data usage. And you're gonna apply governance, and, and I'm finding this to be uh, very helpful at many organizations, look at existing projects. Look to who they're recognizing and who they're engaging as the people in the know about the data and formalize their responsibility when it comes to data governance. So the last thing I really wanna share with you are, it's really all about communications and communicating the operating model to your organization. I always break it down into what I refer to as the three O's of data governance communications, and that is orientation, onboarding, and ongoing communication. So just make certain that as you're developing out your communication, and this would, potentially be the role of your data governance administrator working with a partner who is your data, who is your communication specialist or your change management people. We're going to make certain that as part of our roles and responsibilities, as part of our communication plan, we're going to tailor things specifically to the different levels of the audiences that I just taught, spoke about. The executives don't get communicated with the same way, at the same way as the operational people. The council and the executive level, the strategic and executive, they may be more similar, but make certain that you're tailoring your message to the a part of the organization. What things do we typically include in orientation communication? That is introduction to the program, why it's important to have a program, the level of the program. You notice roles and responsibilities aren't defined here in the orientation because you're, gonna, you're not getting into the how yet when you're orienting people to the ideas of data governance. So then when we get to the onboarding piece, the second O, it's you know, how are people recognized into the roles? What, are, what is expected of them? What is their role-based activity? 
what's uh, uh, job aids are available to them? How can we make this interesting or fun across the organization um, by gamifying it? You know, the ongoing communication can be role-based success, program status, program activities, and those types of things. So communicate, communicate, communicate. And then when you're done communicating, communicate some more. People need to understand what role they play in your overall program. I hope that the model that I just shared with you was helpful to you. I really believe that if you don't, if you're not scared at first view of it, and you consider it as something that should be overlaid over your existing organization, it's a lot less threatening. It's a lot less bureaucratic than, it, than you might have first considered. So I talked about those five levels. I shared with you my operating model. I talked to you about ways that you can customize through color, through the amount of space in each of the sections, in the way that you name your levels, ways to customize the models to match your organization, setting appropriate role expectations, and then how to take that model and start to operationalize it across the organization. And with that, I will kick it back to Shannon to see, do we have any questions for Tim and I today? So many questions, so many great questions. Um, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email. And I think I said Thursday earlier, but today's Thursday. So I will send a follow-up email at the end of day, Monday, <laughs> with links to the slides, links to the recording to everybody so you don't have it in your inbox by the Tuesday morning or you know Tuesday morning Pacific time anyway. Um, uh, let me know. Uh, and also, we had a couple of questions about um, receiving a certificate of attendance. So you can email info at dataversity.net if you'd like a certificate of attendance for attending today. So yes. diving in here to these hot questions. Um, so I, this came in early. So what does interactive approach mean? What does interactive approach? Or was that the uh, iterative approach? I think it was the iterative. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm reading that incorrectly. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, Makes more just, sense. Just brought it up. Do you want to hit it first? Yeah, sure. I could I could jump in first and then, uh, Bob, if you want to add to it. So sure. um, I think uh, I may have first brought up the uh, iterative approach when talking about agile data governance. And I think uh, especially sure. what iterative means in that context is... Um, is making sure that you're not boiling the ocean, right? I think a lot of companies or folks uh, approach governance and they're like, whoa, there's so much to do, so much that we need to accomplish. And, uh, and they really try to do too many use cases at once. Um, and an iterative approach can really mean like, look at what is really important that you need to do. Like, what is that sort of, we call it like the use case backlog of what you're trying to do from a governance perspective and really tackle the biggest issue first get the right people together and think about like, what's the fastest meaningful increment of value that we can achieve, right? Almost like a minimum viable product approach. Like that's what we mean by iterative here is like getting to value quickly, uh, getting that out there, whether it's a policy, whether it's, uh, you know, getting your committee together, whatever that might be. And then, and then getting to the next increment and getting to the next increment. So that's kind of iterative there. Um, Bob, anything that you would kind of add or, or take in another direction there? Yes, certainly. You're not going to govern all of your data in your organization at once. You're not going to flip a switch and have it come on. You're going to need to, I hate the expression of eat the elephant one bite at a time, right? Um, you're, the, the nice thing about it, it, it is that, you know, I think what, Tim, what you were talking about, I consider those initial, those use cases oftentimes to be very critical data element focused. So in fact, I'm working with several clients that they're, they're, they're iterative because they're starting with a very finite set of data that they're considering to be their critical data elements, but they're building a process while they're focusing on governing those specific pieces of data that they can use for another set of data and then another set of data. And you know what? It's going to be better the second time than it was the first time because you've now been through this process of vetting the process. You know, the third time it should be better than the second. So I agree with the, the idea of being iterative is don't try to do it all at once. Learn from what you're doing and that will really help your program to be more successful. I love it. So um, why only financial companies have been able to do end-to-end -end data governance and not other industries? <laughs> Um, I don't know who asked that question, but the uh, 
Um, that's not true anymore. I, at least I, I firmly believe that that's not true anymore. Financial organizations were the ones that embraced data governance first. You know, the whole concept of, of Sarbanes-Oxley, that was really what, when we think back to the, the infancy, the beginning of data governance, a lot of it was focused on Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, but now, you know, privacy of data, uh, analytics of data is no longer just a financial industry thing anymore. So I could, uh, if this person wants to reach out to me and they're looking for examples of other organizations in other industries that have had beginning to end success, well, not beginning to end because a program goes on forever, but have had beginning and sustainable success in their program, please reach out to me. I don't know, Tim, have you experienced it's all finance organizations no, I, that are doing this well? I, I totally agree with you. I think I think it's much broader than finance now and agree that I think finance kind of was at the on the earlier edge of all of this. Kind of it kind of speaks to the power of regulation to really drive action, right? <laughs> um, so right. that's obviously a key driver there. But I think in addition to regulations being important to a really broad variety of companies now, even if regula regulation isn't driving your governance motivation as much, um, you know, self-service analytics, AI, uh, data literacy. There's so much going on now that like it's it's really impossible not for you know for 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 you know any company of any significant scale or size uh, size to sort of avoid governance and 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 many are doing a very good job of it now. Yep, I agree. Love it. So Bob, back to your um, uh, framework slide. Is the data column the domains? No, um, that's not what they're they're meant to be. The, the data column, again, kind of partnered up with each of the different levels as you go down and, and it intersects each of the rows. It is, you know, typically it would be what is the data that is most important to the executive level? What is the data that is most important at the strategic level, at the tactical, the operational, and even at the support level? Um, it is not domains. O oftentimes the business domains or the subject areas are gonna be that tactical level. Again, as I, I talked about how you got your council and then you've got your stewards at the bottom, you know, the council at the top of the, the triangle, but that middle part, you know, those are the people, um, you know, those are the people that we really wanna focus the most on. Perfect. So how is non-invasive data governance different than the invasive counterpart? Any <laughs> examples? Well, I'll just simply use the word assign versus the word recognize. Because in a, in, a, in a more invasive approach, people are assigned to be data stewards instead of being recognized to be data stewards. Instead of, in a, not, in a more command and control approach, they're told you will do this instead of starting with the premise of you're already doing this. In a, a more command and control approach, you're gonna redefine all of your processes, but in a, a less invasive approach, you're going to apply governance to your processes. So it is literally less threatening to the organization because you know what, you already have processes, you have people that are doing things with data, you have a lot of these things that, that can be leveraged as a starting point. So that's why I say it's the path of least resistance and greatest success because we're gonna take advantage of what is already there. If you work for a company right now and your company has been around for five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, you were doing something right. People had accountability for data. It just wasn't formal. Being non-invasive is just formalizing that accountability that you would hope would have existed all along. That's what non-invasive is. Okay, Tim, thank you. To, Tim, yeah. Tim, you want to add anything to that? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> no, I honestly, I think that's perfect. I mean, we're we're huge fans of the non-invasive approach over at Data.World, and and we feel like it it really is the best way to to not boil the ocean and be iterative. So yeah, nothing nothing really to add there other than an endorsement. Okay. Good, thank you. <laughs> well, um, oh, I'm gonna try and slip. Uh, mm, 
I don't know if we can slip. We were just at right, almost right to the top of the hour here. So I'm afraid that's all the time we have, but you can keep your questions coming because I will get those over to Bob and we'll get those answers to you after um, or it's in the follow-up email, which will go out by end of day Monday with links to the slides recording and anything else. And I threw in the chat too. Um, so people had some questions about where to buy your book and you can learn all about non-invasive data governance. Um, so it's in the chat there and I'll make sure that's also included in the uh, follow-up email as well. Kim, thank you so much again for joining us and for data.world for helping to make these webinars happen. Appreciate it as always. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Shannon. And thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Shannon. everybody. Hope you all have a great day. Take care, everybody.